Welcome to Resiliency Web Chats, conversations with individuals in the UMD community about moments in their lives that required resilience. Together, we learn about the strategies they use to stay strong and move forward in challenging times. I'm Dr. Lisa Irwin, and today I'm talking with Chancellor Lenly C. Black. Welcome, Chancellor Black, who, of course, I know as Lynn. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's great to be with you today. Great to have you. So just, um, of course, I've had the great honor and privilege of working with Lynn for 11 years, 11 of his 12 years at UMD, and, and he has experienced tremendous success in academics. Uh, when you think about the research that happens at UMD and, and the great successes students have after they graduate, progress in the overall student experience, I would say, and several national championships. We have to remember those. So you've had just an amazing career in education, and we have been on, a, I think, a three-month celebration of your retirement this summer. And so uh, I think it's really fitting that we're together for this Resiliency Web Chat. So glad to have you here. Thank you. So here we go. Let's start with this. Just a little bit about this amazing career that you've had, your time at UMD, and then just just how you got got here. That's wow. a big question. <laughs> That's a big question. Yeah. Well, um, I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee, um, and I uh, went to undergraduate school at the University of Tennessee Martin, which is a campus of the University of Tennessee, not unlike UMD, although it's a little a little smaller than UMD. Um, and from there, I, I was an English major. I worked a lot in the theater and decided I wanted to pursue my theater interest. And so I went to graduate school at the University of Connecticut, received a master's degree in theater. And it was there that I had an opportunity to do some teaching, uh, which I really just fell in love with. And so I decided I wanted to be a university professor. So in doing some research and talking to faculty in Connecticut, it was pretty clear I would, I would do best if I had a doctorate. And so I started looking at doctoral programs around the country. Um, as I recall, I think I was accepted to five or six, and I had money offers from two or three. And um, really the best money offer came from the University of Kansas, where they were offering me a teaching assistantship. And then later I actually received a fellowship there too. But also they had a strong focus on Russian theater and drama, which would have been an interest of mine for some years. So I went to University of Kansas, I earned a doctorate in theater there, and uh, then started teaching. My first uh, faculty, full-time faculty position was in 1982 at Emporia State University, which Lisa, you know about. And uh, Emporia State is also a regional comprehensive university, also shares a lot of characteristics with UMD, although also is, is smaller than UMD. And so um, when I finally retire some, some month this year, uh, I would have completed 40 years in higher ed as a faculty wow. member administrator um, since I began in 1982 full time. And as I was, um, I really enjoyed my time at Emporia State. It's a good teaching institution, good research institution also. Um, and I, I love being a faculty member. I, I did a lot of directing, directed a lot of theater productions as well as teaching. And then I got into um, administration through student advising. Uh, Emporia State had a student advising center that was very well known nationally. And it was an, an intrusive advising center where we would actually invite students uh, to, to come see us on a regular basis instead of just waiting for them to have a problem. Um, and I started advising in that center. Then over the uh, course of a few years, they needed a director for that center. And I was selected to be director of that center, which was really my first administrative job. That eventually evolved into being a director of undergraduate studies, where I was in charge of advising TRIO programs, and the general education program. And then after doing that for a few years, the dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences needed an associate dean, and he asked me to come join him as associate dean of the college, which I did and continued to oversee the general education program. And then about a year and a half later, he left. And at that point, the faculty said, we want an internal candidate because they had uh, been through about 
three deans in about a five, six year time frame. They were wanting some stability. And so I applied for the job as an internal candidate. I think there were two other candidates as well. And I was selected for the job. So that was my first uh, senior level administrative position as dean of a college of liberal arts and sciences. I had a, I think it was 11 academic departments that reported to me and um, as well as some centers and research operations, et cetera. So that was, um, I stayed in that position for um, nine years. And then um, I had an opportunity to go to Kennesaw State University outside of Atlanta to become provost and academic vice president. So that was another step up from being dean in terms of the university hierarchy. And um, going to Georgia was a great opportunity at the time. Um, and Kennesaw State was a fastly growing university. It was about 15,000 students when I went there and about 22,000 when I left. My goodness. And now, now they're over about 40,000 uh, because they consolidated with, they actually took over another university in the Georgia system and population Atlanta was growing so quickly. So anyway, that was a good experience. But and my wife and I had pretty much decided we were going to stay in the South. For, I'm from Memphis, she's from Nashville. And then I was recruited to look at this job in Duluth, Minnesota, to be chancellor. Um, and at first we were a little skeptical, but the more I learned about UND and, and how much it fit with my interests, with my background, with my aspirations in higher ed, um, it really seemed to be a very good professional fit. And the bonus was that it uh, we, at the time, one of our children and one of our grandchildren, soon to be two of our grandchildren, lived in the, in the uh, Twin Cities. So this is a way to get close to that. So we moved up here in uh, August. Well, actually, we moved in July. I started in August of 2010. And um, it's been a great, great experience um, being at UMD. So I hope that's not too long of an answer, Lisa. But uh, that's, that's how I came to be here. I, I think it's wonderful and, and really interesting. And a couple things I want to pull out of that. One is why Russian theater? I mean, I'm thinking about these sort of linkages to resilience. Yeah. It, well, what was it about Russian theater? Well, and certainly I, I studied Russian theater at the turn of the uh, 19th and 20th century. And, mm -hmm. and resilience was, <laughs> was mm -hmm. they were, they were experts in resilience, unfortunately. Um, well, to try to keep this answer short too. There are a lot of strong linkages between the American theater and the Russian theater of the earliest tw early 20th century. Um, and a lot of American actor training um, has been based upon Russian theories of actor training and approaches to theater. Um, and so there was, there was always, as a theater student, you always learn about Russian theater and quite a bit. And I, I don't know, I just had an affinity for it. I, I, mm. And especially I became interested in Mikhail Chekhov, who is the uh, nephew of Anton Chekhov, the playwright who wrote The Cherry Orchard and Three Sisters and Uncle Vanya, et cetera. Um, and so uh, that, that was really kind of how it developed. And uh, so it was partly just finding an affinity for this approach to theater and approach to actor training uh, that really turned into uh, uh, a lot of my work, my research work. I eventually wrote a dissertation about Mikhail Chekhov, which was turned into a book about Mikhail Chekhov after I was done with my doctorate. Um, so that's really kind of how it, how it happened. Um, and I've had the opportunity to direct some of Chekhov's plays. In fact, one of the best productions I think I ever did as a director was at Emporia State of and Anton Chekhov's Three Sisters. Mm -hmm. And so had a great experience uh, doing that production. So that's, um, but yeah, re resilience is, um, you know, heavy, heavy uh, portion of Russian life, especially during that time period. But it was also, um, you know, I had, had a lot to do with my own life. I came from a very modest family, loving, loving, wonderful parents. My dad had health problems. Um, that were uh, resulting in his, his time during World War II. Mm. 
uh, which got progressively worse. Um, and he died at 49. Mm. So uh, from about the time I was 11 years old, um, we had financial struggles in our household. Um, but I was through a lot of support and loving parents and, and resilience. I guess I learned it pretty early. Um, I was able to do okay and did, did all, all right in school. I was never a stellar student in high school, but I did fine and got through. And um, both my wife and I are first generation college students. Uh, we were the first in our generation, our family generations to graduate from college. And so that, I don't know, I've just, I've, I've always had an affinity for people who struggle and who are successful through a lot of difficulties. And um, so that became part of my professional work as well as part of my, my uh, personal experiences. The other thing that uh, stood out to me is that experience at Emporia, I think, really informed your view of students. I think in that intrusive advising model, yep. you really adopted a, a real compassion for, empathy for, and love of college students. I've certainly observed that in, uh, you know, among the presidents and chancellors I've gotten to work with, I think you, you just really relate really well to students. And I think maybe the roots are there at your time in Emporia, maybe, and teaching. Very much so. And, and it really um, solidified my focus on student success and having high expectations, but also understanding we have a, resp we have a responsibility to help our students meet those expectations. Uh, not that we, we pass everybody. We, we don't. We shouldn't. But... Um, Oftentimes, I think we dismiss students too early, especially those that might struggle in their first couple of semesters. And if we just provide them a little extra help, a little extra guidance, they really have an opportunity to be successful far beyond what they would have otherwise. And uh, so I, I, that stayed with me at, um, at Emporia State and carried on at Kennesaw. Had a wonderful colleague, Nancy King, who was the vice president for um, student success is what it was called there. And um, she and I became very, very good colleagues. And we actually did quite a bit of national presenting on the linkages between student success, student life and, and academics. Um, since I was the provost and vice president for academic affairs. And certainly I think we've been able to continue that here, Lisa, mm -hmm. uh, with our work together and, um, uh, the, the you know, and that's one of the reasons I like this type of institution at UMD is because we really are focused on the students in a deep, significant way, and yet at the same time we are large enough and complex enough to have outstanding, outstanding faculty and staff and um, research that has worldwide implications and. Uh, faculty and staff who are in the community making a difference and helping our students learn the importance of making a difference after they graduate. So true. So having worked so closely together, I'm well aware that you have experienced challenges um, alongside the success in these 12 years. So as you think about this, the, the greatest challenges at UMD, what are the strategies that helped you face them? What are your what are your strategies? What are your mechanisms? Well, to me, it starts with having a, a holistic approach to my life and to my work, um, because especially in these jobs, at times it's hard to se se uh, separate. It's hard to separate the personal from the professional because uh, there there are so many pressures in these jobs. Um, so many, and you're living in a fishbowl. So that you're you're very much open to attacks and and criticisms, you know, as well as great compliments. It's not just a one-way street. So it, it really, I think, I've tried um, over the past several years to really uh, enhance my mental health, my physical health. My my family is incredibly important to me and provides a really strong support structure. But then I've also had great colleagues that, that provide a support structure. And I've also benefited from um, working with uh, leadership consultants, working with um, 
consultants in, in higher ed and also in corporate consultants who help have helped me get through these very difficult times just by focusing on my leadership strengths. And ultimately, that you, you really have to focus on your strengths, not obsess over your things you don't do as well. And um, also understanding the kinds of things you really can control and what you cannot control. And also, although it's hard for me as a, as a theater person and as someone who has a lot of empathy, it's hard not to take things personally. And so, um, because a lot of the criticism I get is more about the position of chancellor, the administrator, as, as it, it, than it is about me personally, because most people who criticize me don't know me uh, personally. And so they're, they're firing shots at, at uh, the position and things that, that I have done in representing UMD. And, and so it's, uh, I think, trying to keep some balance in that is, is in- incredibly important. I would think about that as perspective. Having yeah. the, that perspective is really, really important. Yeah. So what have you observed in others in terms of your leadership here and, and what other strategies around resilience have you seen in students and faculty and staff? I mean, we've, we went through COVID together here. Um, as, as I think about the, you know, the last 12 years, that may have been the most significant challenge that either of us faced. Absolutely. Um, yeah. What, what did you observe among people that inspired you that what resilience strategies did you see? Well, I think part of the resilience strategies, um, one of the reasons I think we got through it as well as we did is because we had done a lot of work before it happened in building a team of people who had very different leadership uh, approaches. And so um, when we suddenly were thrown into the COVID, um, we, we had a team of people who brought different different. Uh, skills, different strengths, different capabilities that complemented each other very well. I think if we had not had that kind of strong complementary team uh, to begin with, it would have been much more challenging to get through it. Uh, Beyond that, um, I think some of the strategies are we had to become more and more comfortable with fast change and with ambiguity. Because, and I, I really think those leaders that do the best and are most resilient over time are able to deal with ambiguity and, and able to deal with change. I mean, oftentimes as human beings, we want answers. We want to get things done. We want to, we want to know what, what the situation is. But in these jobs, and especially during time of COVID, I mean, as, as you'll recall, we, we had very few answers in the beginning, and then the answers we would get would certainly change as more was learned about the pandemic and its impact. And as we were working through with our system colleagues on which decisions would be made by the system, which decisions would be made locally. And and so there was very little black and white, especially early on. It was mostly in the gray areas of what, what the truth is, what the answer is. And so I think that being able to do that is, is critically important. Um, but also, I think um, being able to communicate as best you can and as openly as you can is helpful. And also just trying to make clear when you don't know the answers. Um, I mean, and so you, you try to, you know, you certainly want to provide leadership. You want to provide guidance. But, but there are times when you simply can't do that because we were waiting on the CDC. We were waiting, waiting on um, the Minnesota Department of Health uh, to make decisions. And sometimes they were even making contradictory <laughs> decisions and recommendations. Um, and also we were, I certainly was never trained on how to deal with this kind of pandemic. You know, for years I'd been through trainings of, you know, having an epidemic and how do you treat people. Uh, we went through exercises in Georgia uh, during some of the 
uh, bird flu scares and and SAR scares and those kinds of things. But but those those exercises of training are really really pretty finite in terms of dealing with a situation that may last for days or weeks, perhaps months, but never something that's going to last as long as the pandemic or be as far reaching as this pandemic has been. And so we were we were certainly learning as we went along. Um, and I mean, maybe that's part of it too. Part of the resilience is understanding that you need to keep learning, that you do not have all the answers, even though we may be in positions of authority, more or less. <laughs> um, although that authority is never as 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 clear as as we would like or as some would like, but 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 we're still not experts in all things, especially something like this. So I think trying to be as clear in our communications as we could be about what we do know, what we don't know, what we're still learning, what we're working, but what we're doing in the meantime, because we don't know, it doesn't mean we're doing nothing or sitting on our hands. We're still um, applying our best strategies and our best talents to uh, address, address what we can. One thing I would observe about you too, that I, I found especially helpful during COVID is I think you one of your strengths is not a rush to a judgment or decision. And sometimes that's with you, it's actually an audible breath. <laughs> so that the idea, you know, the idea of taking a breath, I think you, you've, you've alluded to in, in talking through your resilience strategies, you know, this to get comfort with rapid change and ambiguity, you sort of have to take a breath. Yeah. And then and then lean in, and uh, so I, I've always appreciated that about you. And and you were taking a breath sometimes when I I stopped to think you need to do that too. Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> well, but there again, um, yeah, that that's that's because that's who I am, and that's mm -hmm. been my approach with my teaching, my research, my creative outlets from the very beginning. But I also know any success I had had is because I've had people around me who, who, who do it differently. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and so sometimes, I mean, the danger in taking a breath is that you can be, you can wallow in that too much. And when I have others close to me saying, come on, we got to move, we got to make a decision. We got to do this, we got to do that. So there's, there's a balance you need, you need, mm -hmm. that's what I was referring to earlier about these different perspectives. Um, and so it's, it's finding that, that good team that has the right synergy and the right complementarity that uh, you can, um, that's part of the success, big part of the success. So I made a few notes. Let me, let me share back some of the themes I'm hearing and test, test my, uh, my ability to synthesize here. So what I heard from you um, is, is some really good advice around self-care. And I, th that's a buzzword perhaps a bit today, and it's certainly one that our students seem to be more aware of. So it's great to hear you say that in this interview. You're taking a holistic approach, taking care of yourself, um, and, and sort of understanding your own strengths and your, your strengths and your limitations is all wrapped into that for me. Um, I think the idea that team, teams really make a difference when you, you're up against a challenge and help build resilience for everyone. When you've got a team, when you've worked on trust, when you've worked on uh, ways to work together, get to know one another, uh, that, that all is a, is a great way to uh, manage a challenging situation in a resilient fashion. And, and out of that comes the ability to understand what you can control, where you need to have perspective, when is it really aimed at you or is it really not, not aimed at you? Um, and I think the thing that emerges maybe most clearly about you, Lynn Black, is how important a support network, a loving support network is. And that can be your family for you. That is your core. Um, uh, but also it's, a, a, it's who you surround yourself with, that, that, which is also really important support. So those are the things that I heard today that um, have helped you be resilient. So let's end with some advice. If you, um, if you have a student uh, watching this video and who was, you know, facing a challenge, what kind of advice would you give them? Well, if they're facing a challenge, I think um, what I would advise them to do is, is to first of all, try to really understand that challenge. Because sometimes we have a challenge in front of us 
And another part of human nature is we start to catastrophize about that challenge. Mm. We start having these thoughts of how awful it is, how terrible it is. We blow it out of proportion instead of really looking at, at it and trying to understand exactly what it is. And, um, and then the next step is we, do, we, we I would encourage them to find actions and some strategies, some things to do, think through what they need to do to get beyond the challenge. And, and, um, and then also along with that, what kind of assistance might they need to get beyond the challenge? Because, um, you know, if, it, if it's a significant challenge, rarely do we get through those kinds of challenges without some help. And often we are too hesitant to ask for help because we feel like <clears throat> we feel like that we should be able to handle anything or or we get embarrassed about asking for help. And, and so um, that that's what I would encourage them to do. And to not uh, to think through it, to you know, you, you put your whole self into it, but not from the standpoint of just wallowing in the emotion of it. Uh, but you, you've got to find that self confidence that that you can handle this challenge, um, and that you put before you. And it's interesting now that I'm saying all this. Uh, that that's very much the way I've, I've been training actors since mm. 1982 <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because what we do in the theater is that uh, we teach the actors to understand the situation they're in. What are the given circumstances? And then we ask them to think about what do they want? What are they after? What are they trying to achieve? And then they have to understand what obstacles are in their way. And then they have to understand what tactics or strategies they are going to use to get beyond those obstacles. And so this is this is very much. I think it's one of the reasons I was perhaps a pretty good advisor, and and it's carried on into my administrative work as well. And and I would I would advise similar tactics, uh, similar to people in in challenging situations. Um, so it, it is important to know what you want and what you're after. And so this obstacle, you know, how how is it keeping you? How is it in the way from what you're trying to achieve? and then uh, figure out ways to, to get beyond it. Thank you. That's great advice. I do think there's a American sort of love affair with rugged individualism, right? Yeah. That, um, that is, that is sort of encapsulates all those things you said that make it hard. The fact that we have to do things, we think we have to do things on our own. Well, I've really enjoyed the time. Thank you so much today for sharing with us and teaching us about um, the linkages between the theater and resilience <laughs> and Russian theater in particular. It's been really fascinating. It's, it's there. Yeah. Wish you all the best in retirement. Thanks, thank Dr. you so Blake. much, Lisa, and thank you for this. It's been great. Great. Thanks. Best wishes.